you were 18 and you had an arranged marriage. It's close to home about what does the role of women look like. For me, going through the experiences I went through, I realized that doesn't define me. What types of lessons did you learn as you kind of built the business? I do love children. But over the years, I realized I didn't go into this field because I love children. I went into this field because it empowers children. All right, all right, all right. We're going to get to all of that in just a moment. But first, I want you to know how grateful I am for today's podcast sponsor, my friends at Fit AF Nutrition. They are Eastern Pennsylvania's leading meal prep company. Fit AF offers meals of multiple sizes for people with various health goals. And you know what I love about this company? They use high quality ingredients like grass fed meats, wild fish, and locally harvested produce. And all right, for you parents on the go, they even offer family meals. Go to fitafnutrition.com, place your order by Thursday at midnight, and get fresh prepared meals delivered right to your door on Sunday. Use code LECKY at checkout to get 20% off your first order. Here we go, buddy. It's the Ryan Leckie Show. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Ryan Leckie Show. Super stoked for today's episode. Get ready to get inspired. I mean, let me tell you, Zubin Saeed, who's with us on the podcast couch today. You are an entrepreneur focused on empowering women, inspiring kids in education, and you were doing so much in so many communities in Pennsylvania. You kind of hail from mountaintop Pennsylvania now, but you have roots from India. We have a lot to unpack. Are you ready for this? Yes, I'm ready. And I think what's really cool and inspiring, you're a single mother of three who's an entrepreneur who built an incredible business, but you're doing so much to give back and really focus on education in our part of Pennsylvania, Northeastern and Central Pennsylvania. I mean, there's such a shortage. So let's, first of all, I just want to get right to it. Okay. Why education? Why for you? Because you initially wanted to be a doctor. I did. So you want me to unpack the whole story? Unpack the whole story because you actually were born in India. I was. And then you came to the United States, but you have an incredible story on how you really lived the American dream. Yeah. Um, so kind of try to put it in some type of words. I didn't go to school for education, right? So I was brought up in a traditional Muslim house and where culturally we were always asked to like go into the medical field. So I didn't think I should do anything else. And when I started college, at that time I was married, um, I was going to school for biology and didn't think anything of it, you know, struggled through it, um, but I was newly married and I had to make a living. And my parents at that time said, well, why don't you go work in a childcare center? And because I liked kids growing up, uh, I was always a neighborhood babysitter. Uh, so I was like, okay, I can do that. Go to school at three o'clock, uh, go to school all day. And then at three o'clock, go to work. And I did that for about a year and, um, it stressed me out. I was just unhappy working in that environment. I used to come home and tell my mom, oh my gosh, you know, these, these teachers, these directors don't care for these kids. Like, cause I would go to the director and say, Hey, he's crying all day. Let's tell the mom. She's like, just don't worry about it. It doesn't matter. And for me, that was these children are with us 40 hours a week, and it was wasted time that they just put them in front of a TV and then just babysat them. So my, mom's like, my mom was like, well, why don't you just watch kids from the house? Because they had a nice home, a full finished, furnished basement. Um, she said, why don't you just watch kids in the neighborhood at home and make some extra money? I said, yeah, why not? Uh, so I started that and was babysitting after you know my college classes. Um, summer came and a lot of the people, uh, the children that are watching, their parents were like, hey, why don't you work full time in the summer and be a nanny? I was like, okay, I enjoyed it. Um, did it for that summer and loved it. Like my whole basement turned into like a mini classroom. And I started doing that for almost five years and stopped going to school. And I have to pause there. Yeah. I, when you stop going to school, because a lot of people in your family went into the medical field. Correct. Your but parents. I got, but I got married to. Uh, my husband at that time who was putting through school to become a doctor. So okay. it was a good trade-off. So it was like a little balance, yeah. right? Because yeah. a lot of people you said in your community growing up Muslim were like, going to the medical field. Correct. How did some of your relatives handle that when you're like, I'm going into education and I'm doing this? Well, believe it or not, at that time I didn't even say I'm going to education. I just stopped going to school. I was just uh, working full-time, being a nanny, um, and putting my husband through school. So everybody thought, oh, that's really cute. That's fun that you're watching kids. Um, I didn't think anything of it either. I was just enjoyed what I did, loved it. Through that five-year period, I had my first daughter um, that was born through that period. And five years came and my parents moved to this area. I was in the Lansdale, Philadelphia area. That's where I was brought up um, through my later years. 
And my parents were like, hey, um, are you going to get a job? Because we have to move and sell the house. Uh, so they sort of gave us an ultimatum that, what do you want to do? I need you to go back to school. Uh, we're going to sell the house or you figure out something. Um, and I think that was kind of the pivotal moment of, wait a minute, I go back to school for biology? You know, like I loved what I did the last five years. Um, but an opportunity came up in Wilkes-Barre. There was a child care program for sale um, off of 315 by the Woodlands. It was a closed down center. And my mom said, hey, if you really like this, being this daycare worker, which is a bad word, if you really like doing that, there is a program here for sale. Why don't you look at that? Mind you, I'm from Lansdale, Philadelphia area. I didn't want to move up to Wilkes-Barre. My husband was going to Temple University med school. Um, but I came and looked at it. And uh, it was a, in the Fox Ridge Plaza, 3,000 square feet, shut down place. Um, I took a credit card, charged $10,000 on it, took a deep breath and said, OK, let's do it. I was scared to work with adults. I didn't go into this being a business owner or know even how to work with adults. I loved working with children because just due to my childhood and what I went through, I love thriving and working with children. Um, but that moment, I was like, huh, I could maybe do this. So yeah, in 2001, I moved to this area, opened my first center with a credit card, um, and have been evolving since then. And I want to dive into how it evolved, but I mm -hmm. think we can't bury the lead. What is the name of your business now, and how many locations do you have? Just so people know, this is why we're having this chat. Well, it's called Building Blocks Learning Center. And uh, started out with one. It's evolved into 14 and one on the way. And it's expanded into not only providing, providing early care for infants through pre-K, we're also in the local school districts to provide before and after care. Um, that means for kindergarten through fifth grade students. And then it evolved into us providing pre-K programs for some of the school districts. So we have an independent working program working with those students as well. So it's kind of spread out, involved, and grew in many different ways that I never thought or imagined we would get to this point. And if we, we rewind, right, $10,000 in the credit card, you purchased your first child care center. Yep. What types of lessons did you learn as you kind of built the business? I'm always so curious what entrepreneurs have learned along their way. Yeah. Your story of resilience. Well, a lot of, okay, so a lot of times people are always bring up that, oh, you went into education, you must love children. And I was like, I do love children. I enjoy them. Um, I, you know, it, it's a whole point of why I'm driven to do what I'm doing. But over the years, I realized I didn't go into this field because I love children. I went into this field because it empowers children. And if you look at the thread of how this business grew and why it grew, it was on the thread of empowerment. But those lessons came from what I went through as a child. You know, I know you mentioned I was from India. I came here when I was one years of age. But how I grew up and all the challenges I went through made me on put me on this path of empowerment and then working with children to instill on those things that I struggled with growing up. Tell me about, I guess, your message. If people start seeing it, right, you started chipping away small, like one learning center at a time, so to speak. The mm -hmm. first one you put on a credit card, right? Yep. People are like, I kind of want to go shoot my shot and give it a go. I mean, did you ever see yourself as an entrepreneur? Because you said, I didn't have a business background. Yeah, no, I never saw myself an entrepreneur. If you ask me, do I have a business plan? I didn't have a business plan. Um, it grew because of just, uh, you know, my innate, like, drive to believe in what I believed in and kind of push it to the next level. And I think growing up, I didn't have a voice, right? Um, I was a very introverted, quiet child. Um, I think I didn't have a voice in school because I was kind of the gawky teenager. Um, people didn't know if I was Indian or if I was Spanish. Uh, I think today they call it bullying, right? I was called names. I didn't have friends. I was socially awkward. Um, I couldn't even sit here and have this conversation if you talked to me when I was 17, 18. Um, to the point that, uh, you know, when in cafeterias, you, when it was lunchtime, you would go and find your group and sit with them. I didn't have a group to sit with. So I would act like I'm going to the cafeteria when the bell rang. 
And then I would go to the bathroom stall and shut the door and eat my lunch in the stall. Cause I thought you were going to say the guidance counselor's office. Because no. I did that in middle school. No. Because I think, like a lot of people, when I was younger, yeah. right? Well, I love me some food and I still do. Oh, but yeah, I struggled yeah. with like weight issues when I was younger. Yeah. So I also was like self-conscious going to the cafeteria sometimes in middle yep. school. Yep. And I'd be like, okay, I'm just going to go eat my tasty cakes and my ice slushy. <laughs> Remember the, sl- the, hu- the yes, slushies yes, or whatever? Yes. And I would go eat in the guidance counselor's <laughs> office. I thought that's where we were going. But no, for you, no, you were eating. The bathroom. the bathroom. Yeah, because I didn't know where to go. I didn't want people to know I didn't have friends. Uh, I didn't want people. I didn't even know how to tell people um, that I don't have friends. So it was a struggle, and I didn't have a voice, right? So I went through it. Um, you know, I think I had one friend when I graduated from high school. Um, I made it through high school, but I think that stood with me. I didn't join sports. I wasn't in activities. I had a great family unit. I had great parents, um, but. Personally, I think I was struggling to find like who I am and what I want to do. Um, and even in my family unit, I was the quiet one. So they spoke for me, um, you know, and that's why they spoke for me where I was, you know, asked kind of or pushed going into biology. Um, there was also there was a time in my younger years they spoke for me and my parents uh, took me to India when I was 18. And, you know, I got arranged marriage. Um, because I didn't have a voice. I just thought this is what I do. Um, This is what I'm supposed to do. So I followed that. Um, You know, I went through that period. Uh, I did get arranged marriage back when I was 18. And within, it was a whole story, but I ended up getting it, you know, getting a divorce and annulment because it's not something I wanted to do. But I struggled to find my voice um, because I didn't know how to speak up to say, no, this is not good for me. So I think kind of going through all that and rolling into randomly watching children and then developing a business, I realized today that I do that because I want people to have a voice. And I think it's very important that as a human being, you have to find that. Otherwise, you struggle through life and life happens to you. So it's been like a core internal mission that I want to empower human beings and children to have them have a voice. And how do you do that is through just Uh, respect and value and self-awareness. So that's how the programs are designed, I think. And that's why I feel over the course of time they've grown. A lot of people are like, oh my gosh, it's quantity. You're opening all over. You're popping up everywhere. I'm like, no, no, no. I don't want to do that. I don't want, oh my gosh, I have this funny centers. But I want to do it for impact. So if we can go into an area or I feel that, oh my gosh, we can make a difference in families' lives and children's lives and even our teachers' lives, then we do open up programs. So and that's you do that how through we've obvi- grown. Yeah, I yeah. didn't mean to jump in, but you yeah. do that through your sort of your education philosophy. Yes. And what is yes. that? Uh, my education philosophy is one, to empower children, right? And how do you empower children is through giving them opportunities um, and to create the experiences and to create the love for learning. I think it doesn't matter, you know, I always say it's the process, not the product. Um, so what that means is, you know, if you're working with children, it's not that pretty picture they bring home. It's the process that they went through that they got educated with, Um, attention span, following direction, working with each other, uh, gaining self-respect, gaining confidence. Those are the fundamental skills that you need and education gives you so then you can grow up as an adult and make choices and be, have a stable foundation to then be able to decide what you want to do. And there's a lot of theories on how children today should be educated, right? Yeah. How do you navigate roadblocks? Oh. Even if they're coming from the parents whose Correct. kids are helping. Um, yeah, I, we want to make sure families that sign up for our program are people that um, find it, that it's the right fit, that they connect with our mission. You know, I don't, we don't have TVs on site. Uh, we don't believe in timeout. Uh, we believe in positive reinforcement and redirection, giving children's choices. Um, so it's very important for us to find families that uh, – you know, connect with our mission. And we do, you know, I think that's why we're successful because there's so many parents out there wanting to create that foundation and a solid environment for their children that it's been our part, uh, parents have been our partners. And I think that's another way this business has grown is the feedback we get from families of the environment we're creating so their children can be successful in school has given us that power to, you know, develop and open more. And children are only successful in schools when they have great educators and people who really care. 
there's such a shortage of teachers and fewer people going into the education field. So you started getting involved, I think even launching a program called Bridge the Gap, and you're working with Wilkes University yes. in Wilkesbury, Pennsylvania. Describe sort of the reasoning behind that and how you're trying to help fill the void with people not going into education. Yeah, um, when I first started, right, uh, we had maybe, I had three employees. Um, today, we're on the cusp of 160 employees. So, Did you ever imagine this, by no, the way? No, because I couldn't even work with adults and people, and I didn't want to be, you know, the boss. I didn't know what that meant. Um, but to go from, sometimes I have to pinch myself to be like, oh, my gosh, we impact that many people and support that many employees. It's amazing. And I think of what you said in the beginning when you're like, I went in to buy a child care center yeah. on a credit card to be like, I'm going to do this and yeah. I'm going to figure it out. You didn't have a business plan. No. And that's what I think slows people up from living yeah. their dreams, opening a business or going out to shoot their shot because yeah. sometimes they just think there's all this red tape yeah. and I got to check this. I got to check I this. I feel sometimes you use that as excuses. I'll be honest. You when know? I started, I didn't have a, I had somewhat of like a one pager business plan, yeah. but I didn't have this huge booklet. And guess Correct. what? You figure it out you as you go. It out. You got to go with your gut. And you got to take risk, and it has to be the unknown that you're going into. And I feel that's what makes you more successful. But if you sit there and wait for the right time to start your business, people do it. But, but they're going to keep waiting, I correct. think, right? Can't I always say the time, time is yeah. now. And the experience you, says you get from just the raw, organic way of starting a business, that's why you're more successful, because you can build off of that, and you can learn off of that, and you can learn from your mistakes. So... A lot of people come up and they're like, oh, I want to start a business. Do it. What's stopping you? I didn't have any formal education. I obviously went back to school um, now over the last, you know, 10 years and got my uh, degrees and everything. And because I still fundamentally believe it's important, education, even at the highest level, is very critical because it just opens you up to fundamentally um, give you opportunities and um, makes you think differently, which is really important. But when you want to start something, whatever it is in life, just go for it and take that risk. I think that's what's critically important to be successful. And I'm sure that's probably coming back to why you said I'm going to start Bridge the Gap. Yes, yes. Tell me about that program with so, Wilkes University. having these many employees, and the majority of them are women, I'm excited to say that we have a percentage of uh, males that work in the company, which is great, especially in a childcare setting for children You know, growing up to have that male role model. It's been amazing. Um, but working with so many women, I recognize, especially in our, in our industry, a lot of them didn't have opportunities to go to school um, or life happened to them so they couldn't finish school. Um, so for me, it was important that we're working with children and empowering them and we're educating families and empowering them. But here I have a platform to educate women. So it internally developed as let's create pathways for them to further their education. I don't care if they stay with me or not. I always tell every employee that whether you're with me one year or five years or 20 years, get something out of it. You get a paycheck, but get an education out of it. You and I are the same person. Yeah. I tell my team that all the time. I said, yeah. we're going to get you training. And whether you're with us for one year or 10 yeah. year, right? We yeah. want to grow you professionally, whether you're with us for 10 years yeah. or you decide to go work in Hollywood for some Correct. big movie production company. Yeah. If we can set you up for success... And I'm going to get back to bridge the gap. But yep. do you feel like that's where entrepreneurs kind of fail because they just want to hold everybody in and yeah. be like, oh, my gosh, I hope these people never lead me. And right. I feel like if I'm not growing people professionally, yeah. I'm not doing you're, my and job. And then you're not growing your business either. Exactly. And I always say, uh, you know, the team you have today might not be the team you have tomorrow. And I think you have to be OK with that because a lot of people get set on, oh, my gosh, you know, we have especially in today's day and time. Longevity is not a thing anymore. So stop planning for that. But if you have someone for that one day and they give you 150%, I take it. That's great. And if they leave tomorrow, we're better for it because they gave us that 150%. But like you're saying, for me, it's if they leave from us, leave with something. So if it's a degree, if it's experience, if it's a certification, you're better for us. And in return, those are the great advocates that support your business because they're now out in the community supporting and giving positive feedback to it. So for me, I look at it, it has to be a win-win situation for everybody. And how does Bridge the Gap work and align with all of that to well, kind of build future leaders and correct. educators? Yeah, there is a shortage of te teachers. I think since there was a shortage before the pandemic, uh, I think the pandemic kind of highlighted it. Um, brought education to the forefront because I think as a society, we recognize that, holy God, education is so critical and important. I think it even gave us an opportunity as early child care providers to sit at the table. 
Uh, many times before COVID, I used to go knock on doors, the business world, and they're like, oh, you're a daycare, you know, okay, you know, you're watching kids and just kind of shunned away. But it's evolved and changed where now we're at the table, right? As a community, we talk about where's the uh, Starbucks going? Where's Target going? Do we have a hospital? But do we ever talk that we need a child care program? Because all those places have employees. And if they don't have stable employees because they can't find childcare, then they don't have any employees. So I think it's brought to the forefront of why childcare is important, why early education is important. With that being said, a lot of teachers didn't go into this industry since the COVID times. I think it's uh, you know the stress and all the negativity that it's brought about to it there's less and less teachers going into education. So our goal is if we are a, a company, you know, as a business, it's our responsibility to give back and maybe we can shift and make an impact. Um, so what we're doing is we are collaborating with, you know, Wilkes University, uh, King's College, uh, Misericordia to see if we can create path lines that can give um, in real time training and development for teachers that want to go into the field of education. Um, and creating opportunities so they can learn the soft skills. And sometimes they go into and work in the real world of what education is like, and maybe they don't want to do it, but they're stronger for it because they know what they want to do. So it's been, we launched it this September. It's been pretty amazing and successful. I think uh, this semester we're poised to have about 25 interns. Uh, so these are potential uh, educators that are going into this field, but they can also be potential employees in the future, not only to us, but to other programs that are out there. So that's been our mission and goal to see how can we bridge this gap, because there's a disconnect when you go to school, you know, you graduate after your four-year degree, and the reality of what work is like, there's a disconnect with that. But why don't we marriage the both? While you're going to school, you can earn a paycheck or get your credits or have um, just this experience shadowing with other teachers and learning kind of the real stuff of what it's about teaching in classrooms besides the book things. Um, and it's given us really great uh, response from the people that are going through the program. So it has, it's unseen what it's going to develop into because I think there's so much potential that we're working on, but I'm really excited about it. And from one Building Blocks Learning Center in 2001 mm -hmm. up until you're getting ready to open your 15th location, mm -hmm. what do you look for in your future employees and people who want to be a part of the team, but also be able to grow and learn as sort of next generation of educators? Yeah, um, people that want to invest, people that are mission driven. Um, not every employee is the right candidate for us, right? So we do a little bit of soul searching with them to figure out, is this the right fit? Um, I always believe in 22 days make a habit. Uh, so we sort of have a 22 day roadmap that when people come on board, we give them 20, figure it out. Is this the right fit? Are we the right company? And for us, vice versa, um, are they the right fit for our culture? I love that. So that's different than like a probationary period of Correct. 60 to 90 days. Yeah. This is 22 days. See if Make you like habit. it here. Yeah. And if you don't, no hard feelings. Yeah. Yeah. I think I rather respect you come to me and say, hey, this is not what I thought of, oh, I thought for, I thought of, or maybe this is not the right fit. I'd rather have that, and let's have an open dialogue about it instead of just a no-show or not, you know, some people just kind of just get up and leave. Why? Talk about it and figure out if this is not it, what is it? Um, so it's important for us to, and I think we've found a really good formula to bring the right people on that are um, mission-driven, and if they don't know what that is, to find that fit with us. What do you think the key factor is that's causing fewer people to go into the education field? Does it come down to the salary teachers are paid? Um, not always. I think, uh, and that's where uh, we started an initiative with the support of United Way. We ca um, call it Catch the Magic. Uh, because I think there's a lot of emphasis being put on the strains that teachers deal with, uh, what teachers are going through, but we're not highlighting the positive of what they're doing and the impact they're making. So I think, one, we need to respect and value education. And I think in our society, we don't respect and value it as much as other countries do. I don't think we put a lot of place and value on early education. Uh, and I think the teachers are a byproduct of that, the negativity with that. So the Catch the Magic um, initiative is to bring awareness of we need to respect the educators. And I think more than the salary, it's the dignity that teachers want and the respect and the value that they provide. I don't think we give that to them as a society. So the initiatives I've been working on is to bring awareness that how do we respect these people that are 
impacting and changing uh, the future for our, you know, future um, children that are coming up. And I think what's so crazy, I think like you have so much on your plate between managing a team of 160 people, mm -hmm. opening your 15th location, yeah. you have the Catch the Magic initiative, Bridge the Gap initiative, and there's also this huge passion project in Wilkesbury mm -hmm. to help kind of grow the city of Wilkesbury, but you know, and, uh, and including the pocket park project. Uh -huh. I'm amazed. Like, how are you fitting <laughs> this all in, and and what is that? Well. I always feel, you know, you only have, you're only one person and you only have one time on this earth. So make an impact. And for me, I want to look back and know I worked hard and we had these businesses and we have a great team of people. What impact did we make? What legacy are we leaving? Um, so it's very important for me as a business to give back to our community. So it's showing up in different ways, but all of it has the same core fundamental um, connection, which is empowerment. So going into developing or being part of the development of Wilkes-Barre is, you know, I'm on uh, a lot of boards, I've worked with amazing uh, people and amazing initiatives that are already rolling out. Um, but I want to be part of that. So for us, I was able to purchase a little plot of land in downtown Wilkes-Barre. So my goal eventually, uh, we're working on it right now, is to develop into some type of community space, a pocket park of some sorts, um, because there's not a lot of green space in downtown. So I wanna be helping to bring that and see if we can change that. Um, and then it, we're opening a location on Main Street in Wilkes-Barre and uh, working with great you know, partners and business partners so why not revitalize that street? So we're creating this whole festival of the arts and seeing if we can do a mini makeover for our street in downtown on Main Street and see if we can bring back culture and arts because I think it's so core and fundamental to develop ourselves as a community, as a society. We need to have arts and culture and respect and value it. So working really hard to be part of the solution and see if I can give back and help that momentum. And I know you're bringing a lot of women along with you to help build these projects, to better the community, to empower kids, but also, as I mentioned before, empowering women. Mm -hmm. Coming back to when you were 18 and you had an arranged marriage, mm -hmm. how do you feel about that today? With Because it still happens in the culture. Yeah, yeah. How do you feel about that today and also women's role in society and how they've grown? I mean, look at how many women are CEOs now. And Correct. Where are we heading with everything? Wow, that's a loaded question. Yeah. Uh, and unpack I have, that. <laughs> yeah, I'll unpack it. And I have three daughters. So um, I know it, it's close to home about what does the role of women look like and, you know, where did arranged marriage fit? I think for some people it works. I think um, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, I think my circumstances were I just was, you know, had my own issues of not knowing who I am and what was right and wrong for me. Um, and I do still believe in custom and, and you know, uh, tradition and culture. Um, so that was organically, I understand why I went through that route. But it really helped me understand women in some ways um, or, or the plight that women go through. I think we're defined so much by society, uh, by man, by our family structure, that as women, and these are the conversations I'm having with other women, we wear that as a burden. And we define that of who we are. And for me, going through the experiences I went through, I recognize and through evolution, I realize that doesn't define me. It shapes me and it shaped me, but it def didn't define me. I think when I got divorced and back in that day in my culture, I was one of the few that got divorced. How did your parents take it? When you said it was a struggle i went through a lot yeah yeah um it, they were as much uh, they're kind loving supporting families but it was a lot and society wise it was a lot going into different you know uh community events they're like that's the one that got divorced you know and i'm like oh gosh you know and i didn't think i didn't want to be the black you know listed person in the family of like the black sheep of the family but I was for a little while because that's how it was viewed, that it was, you know, shunned upon. You didn't talk about it. So that was, you know, I wore that, you know, like the scarlet letter that I'm like, I was shamed because I brought this upon my family. Um, and I wore that for a long time. Um, and I ate because of it because, you know, I ate my feelings of I felt bad and guilty and went through that. Um, but I recognize, again, through the process of developing my own uh, business and finding my voice that, wait, 
that should shape me, not define me. And I think the conversations with women I'm having today is we have to stop that. We have to stop carrying that burden and we walk with it. So why don't we stand on top of it and own it and help us shape us and then be stronger for it. And I think that's the conversations I want to have with the women that work in my company, with the women in my community, my friends, my, my daughters, that don't let it um, define you, shape you, and find when you have self-awareness and you find that empower in within you, that's when you're going to be successful in life. And success doesn't mean it's not equated to money. It's just equated to uh, you having self-worth and value and having a voice in what you do. And for women who see this, right, I think they don't, see all the work and you yeah. digging in over the past, you know, 20 plus years yeah. to build your building blocks mm -hmm. learning center, right? To where it is today, 15 locations you're going to be at. Yeah. What's the message though, that you give to women who say, gosh, I want to be an entrepreneur, but they maybe, maybe I'll focus on that plan a few weeks from now, a few months from now, because yeah. you're a single mom of three, mm -hmm. you're doing it. Yeah. What would you say to people who want to do it, but there's these walls they just can't get past? Um, one, mentoring is wonderful to find people in your community and find other women that can help you uh, through that process. Because sometimes if you are a single uh, parent or if you're by yourself and you don't know where to turn to, mentoring I think is very critical, especially women to women, to find someone that believes in you. I had a lot of people from my own mother to community members uh, that believed in me through this process. I remember when I started my own business, um, and I was still, I had no idea, you know, if I'm doing this or if this is right. And I had uh, Maureen Straub, who used to be in the banking world, uh, kind of took me under her wing and believed in me. Uh, uh, I went to her with, you know, my first loan and did things like that and with a kooky plan. And she's like, I see it. I see what you want to do. And just getting that support was enough for me to like build on. So I think women that are struggling to see what do I do? Where do I go? Find someone that believes in you. And sometimes you might not find that and it has to be yourself and you have to rely on that. I think initially it was myself that I found the power within me to just persevering and keep going through what I believed in my gut that could happen. Um, but if you can't do it yourself, then find other people to help being a mentor. I think it makes a huge impact. And seeing where you are today, mm -hmm. coming back to the story you told at the beginning of this podcast mm -hmm. of the girl who ran away from the lunchroom because, in your words, you didn't think you had any friends and yeah. you ate in the bathroom. Yeah. What would you tell that girl today? Um, well, one thing, like, I don't think I would change anything that has happened to me. I think all the things in my life and all the experiences I went through were so organic and really made me who I am today and really helped me find my core strengths. Um, and I think as a human being, a, a fundamental skill you should have is reflection. You, you should reflect on your life and what you went through and re reflect any situation you're going through and find the value in it. So I wouldn't change anything. What would I tell that girl is, it'll be okay. Uh, you know, and uh, even my own children growing up, they think, oh my gosh, it's the end of the world. This is it. What's going to happen? Especially with social media. I Correct. see it. I have nieces and oh my gosh, yeah. if somebody has a dress they don't have, it's like the end of the world and Correct. it's like a meltdown, yeah. right? It is. It is. But I think that's the thing that, and I was always told this as a kid and I couldn't see it. Yeah. The older you get, yeah. the less you care about what other people Correct. think. Yeah. And isn't that such a release I know. and a feeling of It would of be not great if we knew that when we were young so we don't go through those struggles. And you're told that, at least correct, I was, correct. but it's such a sense of empowerment yeah. and authenticity when you could be like, you know what, this is who I am, take yeah. it or leave it, and it doesn't keep you up at night anymore. Correct. But I think you have to go, go on that road and go through that evolution to get to that point, and wow, is it liberating to feel that. You know, I love this you know, mindset I am today. A lot of times, again, women also struggle with uh, finding the balance. You know, they're always like, I got to get that balance from my, you know, my significant other to my children, to my work, to my own organic family. I got to find that balance. There's no balance. You can't give everything 100% here, 100% there. What I, my, I always believe in a word for the year. So my word this year is harmony. I think it's important to have harmony in your life because it's ebb and flows. You know, today my relationship might need 60% and my work might only need 40%. But I think if you recognize that it's an ebb and flow that, hey, it's going to sometimes some things need more attention than the others, it's okay. You'll be more successful and less stressed. But if you try to say, I got a work-life balance, 
There's no such thing. You can't balance that. And as an entrepreneur, I'm sure yeah. you can relate to this. Yeah. We could work 24 hours a day and still yes. not be caught up. Yes. Yeah. It, that's what, uh, I mean, yes. Uh, I think you asked earlier, how do you do that with all these projects and all that's going on? It's a drive. It's an internal drive. But I think it's so mission connected that for me, it's not work. It's a passion. And it's, it's the compass that leads me every day and drives me every day. So for me, I always tell everybody, find that compass. If it's, you know, working at the drive through somewhere or reading a book at home or starting your own business, there's no right or wrong or better or worse. Just find what clicks with you and find your compass and stay on that road. I truly believe the world, the, you know, the universe speaks to you. You just have to listen. And the universe speaks to you to make you successful. And if you tune into it, you're only going to be successful. My daughters are always like, things always work out for you. I'm like, honey, no, they don't. I work hard at it. And I cue into what the environment's telling me and how to kind of move forward. So, And listening to your gut. Yes. Never forget that. Final thoughts or things you're excited about moving ahead in the future with projects? Um, just the evolution of it, right? To see the impact of it coming to life and to have that impact on the human beings in our community, uh, on the educators, to see that, um, have that impact and to keep giving is exciting for me. And to see what that evolves into is going to be exciting because there's a lot on the horizon. And do you feel by getting involved in all of these projects you've done, whether it's Catch the Magic, Bridge the Gap, the more you're giving, do you feel like you're getting more? Oh, without a doubt. Yeah, without a doubt. I think um, just all the hard work of, you know, coming from where I came from and investing the way I did into having this belief to see it come to life, uh, the reward is I can't even, um, you know, uh, capture what kind of feeling it's giving me and how it's empowering me. But it's amazing to see the rippling effect of that. And I have an amazing team that works for me. I think the only way we're able to grow, the only way we're able to carry out is, yeah, I have an idea, but it's the people that are working for me that are carrying this out and driving the force behind it. Um, so I've been very fortunate to meet amazing people um, throughout this journey and have amazing people working for me that have dedicated and devoted um, their time, their energy, their life to carrying this out. So I think that's what's even um, uh, greater for me from going on not having connections, not having friends, to then having this team of people that are, you know, mission and driven vision. So I love that. This yeah. was such a fun chat. I feel like Thank so you. inspired now. I'm like oh, jacked awesome. up. This I appreciate was great. That. Thank and, you for your time. And you mentioned mentorship. Yes. Such an important role in your life. If people just want to learn more about the projects you're involved with, what's the best way people can connect with you? Is it through LinkedIn? Is it through a website? How do they learn more about all things Zubin. Correct. Yes. Uh, well, we're in the process of developing that because uh, I recognize as a business, sometimes you're building the plane as you're, you know, flying it. Um, so Did you that. Could, yep. Yes. Sometimes right? I feel like I'm still doing it. Yeah. I think even after 25 years in business, I'm still doing it. Uh, but you can contact me directly at my email. Um, we do have a company website as well. Um, but I know social media wise, we're developing content for it. So. And we'll put the email and yes. your website and everything in the description. That. So thanks so much for your time. This yeah. was a blast. Awesome. Good time. Thank you. Zubin, Saeed, thank you so much. And thank, thank you Ryan. for being a part of another episode of The Ryan Lecky Show. See you next time. Here we go, buddy.